Well, hey everybody, glad that you are joining us again as we continue our study of the Gospel of Matthew. I'm uh, continuing to tinker with our setup here and how I uh, use the whiteboard behind me. Um, and I think this week I did a decent job of writing in a legible fashion and should be out of the way of it most of the time. I think the questions that I've got are, are good questions for the passage that we're looking at. Um, and the other thing that I think is important as we look at the passage that we are, which is Matthew 15, 1 through 20, is how um, this really serves as a turning point in, gospels, uh, in Matthew's gospel. We've just had this moment where the disciples recognize Jesus for who he is, truly or the Son of God. They worship him. Um, Peter is willing to step out of the boat for him and embrace the turmoil, and sure, he eventually um, succumbs to fear, but uh, those are all very important steps and extremely important images for Matthew's audience. Um, but tonight, uh, we begin to get to the point where Jesus' challenges to the religious leaders of his day um, become harder and harder for them to ignore. They become more and more direct. And of course, ultimately, it's going to be those sorts of um, confrontations that lead to his crucifixion. Um, and so those are important things to, to pay attention to. But the other thing uh, that we need to notice in this process is um, how Jesus is opening um, faith to a much wider um, swath of humanity than um, those who represent traditional um, Judaism in the first century are. And, and I, I, I say that for a particular way, because um, even in the Old Testament, it's very obvious that the inclusion of people outside the community was always a part of what was going on. Like, it starts very early. I, they, they're not even in the land yet, and they picked up Rahab and her family. It's that sort of, of inclusivity that is... Um, par for the course in, in the Old Testament, even if there are, are moments when um, we read passages in a way that would suggest that it's very exclusive, you always see examples of non-Jewish people becoming um, not only part of the community, but uh, the heart of the community. Like You go very quickly from um, Ruth to David, you know, a Moabite woman to king of Israel. And so those are... Um, Incredibly important markers, especially especially for Matthew's audience, who, though predominantly Jewish, very much uh, in and around the land of, of Israel, probably just outside after the, the revolution, um, the church itself in that time period is quickly becoming Gentile, and they're trying to figure out where they fit and how they fit. And the story that we're looking at today, where Jesus challenges traditional understandings um, that have been um, put into place by some of the religious sects of their time, um, the story that immediately follows it, the one that we will look at next week, is the faith of a Gentile woman. Um, so I, I want you to pay attention to how all of those parts are moving in this story, and how important they are to highlighting um, Jesus' ministry and what it meant for the, you know, second and third generation of Christians, and then what it means for us, and how um, how we navigate life and faith in the modern world. So Matthew 15, 1 through 20, um, begins this way. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrive from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. And Jesus replied, and why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandment of God? This is what we call rapid escalation. Um, for instance, God says, honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents, and so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as direct commandments of God. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, Jesus escalates that confrontation very quickly. He doesn't bother trying to explain why. It's not a big deal to him. Um, he claps back at them with their own hypocrisies, their own failures to follow uh, the law, not just the traditions. And, and I think I want to take a minute to talk about the difference between these two things, which I have before, um, but it is important to understand how the Pharisees come about and, and how they see themselves and what they are trying to accomplish. So uh, the Pharisees as a group, um, you, you notice if you read through the Old Testament, you never see that name uh, mentioned. And they don't really exist until after, um, they, they kind of begin. Hope you enjoyed the update from ESPN. I will go ahead and silence my phone. Um, the, they, the roots of them exist after the destruction of the first temple. Um, when there's no longer a, a temple to worship in and they're trying to discover what it means to worship God without that, um, you, you begin to get a decentralized um, form of Judaism where the Pharisees thrive. Um, around the year 2-300 BCE, so two or three hundred years before Jesus, it becomes a more and more formal group. And you get a, a group called the Pharisees and their goal is to um, ensure that uh, the, the people understand God's law and keep it. And anytime there's a question about what that looks like, um, they offer guidance, instruction, wisdom, what become traditions. Um, so they offer responses on how to follow the law in certain situations. For example, what constitutes work on the Sabbath? They disagree with each other. Um, there are different groups of Pharisees, and they don't all believe the exact same thing. They take some things more seriously than other Pharisaical groups might. There are like six to 10,000 of them in the time of Jesus. The idea that six to 10,000 of anybody would agree on everything is just mind-numbing. Um, and so they, they disagree. But the purpose of, of what they were doing to ensure that the law was kept, not just by them, but by those who fell under their influence, was to ensure that the people were not um, enslaved, oppressed, the temple not destroyed again. It was because the, the understanding that they had received from the prophets was that the invasion and destruction of Israel and the temple and of Jerusalem had come about because the people were unfaithful to the law. So how do we ensure that doesn't happen again? We make sure we're faithful. And so where there are gaps in the law, gaps, when there are questions, they provide understanding and direction. That's it. Um, what Jesus points out here is how some of those practices, traditions, understandings, and directions, which were meant meant for good, meant to clarify, meant to guide, meant to, um, to shape faithfulness, actually, in practice, end up being used in a way that goes against the purpose of the law. Now, I think it's easy for us to look with, you know, 2,300 years worth of hindsight and say, well, how could you ever be so stupid as to think that doing this and, you know, not taking care of your parents, which is the example Jesus used, would be okay just so you could, you know, give some items to God. But if we're more introspective, I think we can understand the ways in which traditions, which is the word the Pharisees use here and one we understand well, can become more important than gospel. Um, and that's essentially what happens here. And Jesus points out this quote from Isaiah that there is a huge difference between honoring God with your lips and honoring God with your heart. Um, and the Pharisees in this moment are called out for doing the first but not the second. And so Jesus points out this gap that exists between Rituals, traditions, practices, doctrine, however you want to term those things, 
that we place as so central to faith um, versus faith itself, the heart and purpose of God embodied by God's people. Um, and so then Jesus has this confrontation with the Pharisees. I doubt that it's a quiet confrontation, and I doubt that they're alone. There seem to be people standing around listening in. And so in verse 10, Jesus calls the crowds um, to come together. And he says, listen and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Um, and the disciples immediately like grab him like, dude, shh, Jesus, knock it off. Don't you understand that you're offending the Pharisees. Like, that, that's the next verse. Um, and the Pharisees carry some power and weight with the people. They're not exactly the type of individuals you want direct confrontation with. Um, if you want to have bigger con conversation about what it means to follow the law in Pharisaic tradition, when that usually happened, and Nicodemus highlights this for us, is at night. Um, Jesus and Nicodemus don't end up talking at night because Nicodemus is scared. Nicodemus treats Jesus like another teacher of the law. This is a conversation that he's filling out. That's par for the course. Pharisees had day jobs. Um, that, that's part of why this, you know, functions this direction. But this is not a night conversation. Protocols get broken. This becomes a very public spat. And Jesus wants to make sure that people understand the difference between traditions for tradition's sake and living for God. And that might mean doing the same thing. Jesus is not saying, no, you can't wash your hands. No, you can't dedicate stuff to God. Um, Jesus is trying to pry at what lies underneath the decisions that get made that way. Um, Jesus, in verse 13, says, Every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be uprooted, so ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind. He's talking about the Pharisees. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into the ditch. Peter said to it, Jesus, explain to us the parable that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. Because you'll remember, this is still going to be a problem for Peter in Acts. Like, potentially several years after this moment, depending on when this conversation happens. And it is, you know, maybe a decade between this conversation and, and Peter's vision in Acts. Peter does not have the bandwidth to understand that what you eat doesn't defile you. Now, why wouldn't he? Well, he's a Jewish man who's grown up with these traditions that shape how he lives, the practices that he takes. And it's not like Jesus was out there eating pepperoni pizzas for every meal and flaunting um, dietary customs. Traditions, rules, those in and of themselves are not bad things. Um, but Jesus wants his disciples to understand the difference between tradition as tradition and treating tradition as if it is Torah. Um, because therein lies, a, 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 or treating tradition as if it is the heart of God. Um, the law was given to direct people towards God. Um, it was not a replacement for God. And in some ways what happens is it becomes treated as if it is God itself. And Jesus is kind of highlighting those differences. Jesus looks at Peter, who asks this question. It says, anything you eat passes through the stomach and goes into the sewer. Simple enough. But the words you speak, those come from the heart. That's what defiles you. And notice, I think what he's saying here is not that it's your words that defile you. It's your heart. Um... For the heart, uh, for, from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with one washed hands will never defile you. Um, and I think what we have in the Pharisees is um, in some ways a good uh, comparison to us today. In our churches, um, we have traditions, we have rituals, whether we call them that or not. We have doctrines, we have practices that become ingrained over time. Um, and some of those we end up elevating to the status of gospel. 
Um, we begin to treat them with the type of importance that the Pharisees in this conversation treat hand washing, the type of thing that separates people from God. That, that's how the Pharisees view this. Um, Jesus, on the other hand, wants to bring back, bring the, the conversation back around to um, what's on the inside, uh, the, the purpose and direction a, a person lives with. Because ultimately, that's what's going to steer you right or wrong. Um, I think there are a, a number of, of, I think there's probably a decent portion of people throughout history who have, in, uh, in their attempts to live faithfully, and I use that as a very open-ended phrase right now, um, fallen into an approach to life that has allowed them to live kind of however they wanted, as long as they got the practices right. So as long as they um, went to the right church, or as long as they prayed before meals, or as long as they um, carried out the right rituals, as long as they, you know, all of these different things that are very much man-made, like Pharisee hand-washing uh, rules. Again, that doesn't make them bad. Please don't stop washing your hands. Um, but whenever we place the emphasis in the wrong order or in the wrong place, we reveal something about ourselves. And truthfully, I think what we often reveal is that it's easier and that we recognize that it's easier to follow rituals than it is to follow God. It's easier to get the practices right than the heart right. And so we settle for less because it requires less of us. Um, and the other thing I would add to that is we do that while thinking that we're on the right track. Um, I don't think the Pharisees were malicious, um, but not towards the law or in their attempts. They weren't trying to lead the people astray. They weren't trying to give bad advice. Um, they were trying to help. But all the effort in the world to help um, doesn't get you very far when you're steering people in the wrong direction. And um, they're driving people towards practices um, instead of God. They're enforcing tradition without much recognition of the God behind it. Though they wouldn't have seen it that way. That's what Jesus calls them out for here. And, and so I offer up these two questions that have been on the board the whole time. And uh, one last chance to look at them before we call it a night. Uh, what value do the Pharisees and others find in their tradition? Um, and I think the answer to that question informs the second one, which is in what way do we fall in the same traps and routines? Um, I think noticing those two realities um, for the Pharisees and for ourselves is important as we try to decipher what it actually means to live faithfully versus very often what we've been handed, what's been handed down to us. Um, again, that doesn't make traditions in and of themselves wrong. They form communities. They create longevities. They give you a lineage and a heritage, and those are not bad things. They, they identify community, but when they become the boundaries of the community, the thing that decides who's in and who's out, um, I think we've missed the mark. Uh, I think Jesus warns us here while warning the Pharisees against making the same mistakes that they do. All right. Glad that you were with us um, this afternoon. I think I managed to make this one just a shade shorter than some of the others. Um, we'll continue on. We'll move again, like I started tonight. We'll move from this story to the faith of a Gentile woman, somebody who exists outside the boundaries of the Pharisees. Um, and I don't think that's accidental. Matthew doesn't do anything accidentally. It's a very intentional reminder that uh, when you get caught up in the wrong things, you exclude people that shouldn't be excluded. And Jesus is always pulling people in that others have left out. Um, and I think that's a good thing to remember as we wrap up this evening. Again, if you've not read through Matthew's Gospel yet and, and sit down and work your way through it, um, please take the time to do so. That's the way it's meant to be taken in. And I would love um, for you to get the opportunity to do that. Um, all right, we'll wrap up. Glad that uh, glad that you joined us. We'll do it again next week. Bye, all.